So sweet. So this is to officially open the Ansible Meetup for today, August 2020. And today um, it's going to be um, a very interesting um, presentation coming from our speaker. But before that, I just want to make sure that you guys are aware that Ansible Meetup is going virtually and everything is going to be for free. There will be a lot of uh, um, side sessions, breakout sessions, keynotes from different um, you know, major players in the industry who's doing fancy, cool, and fun automation with Ansible. So make sure you register ansible.com, Ansible Fest. So it's going to be for free on October 13 to 14. Sweet. Before we start, just a few Meetup notes. I think you know all all these things, but um, this session will be recorded for your reference and will be uploaded on the Meetup site for those who weren't able to make it this lunchtime. And if you have the, uh, questions, just put them on the Q&A box. Uh, we will be uh, asking Tony if uh, it's directed to Tony, so feel free to uh, write the questions right there and then, and hopefully we can uh, help answer them for you. And don't forget to interact on the chat uh, box that's on your right side of um, of your uh, blue jean screen. So let's make this fun. Let's make this interactive across all the uh, Ansible's participants. Sweet. So we are glad and really lucky to have him today. Please welcome Tony K. Uh, welcome, Tony, our senior principal architect at Red Hat. Tony leads the team for automation and management in uh, Red Hat's GPTE DevOps and automation team. He also works globally but his main focus is on a uh, hybrid cloud automation with the use of Ansible. Tony, uh, I think he spent most of his time automating production cloud deployments and uh, you know, developing both code and training content for everyone. He also deliver automation training globally, not only to Red Hat, but also to partner consultants. That also includes architects on cloud infrastructure that are using Ansible. And some interesting facts about Tony. Tony is uh, Sc Scottish, so I reckon Tony loves single malt. He can probably uh, tell us about it later on. He is now based and is joining us all the way from Boulder, Colorado, with his two wife. I mean, with his wife and two daughters. Sorry about that, Tony. <laughs> with his <laughs> wife and two daughters, uh, where he mainly, you know, rock climbs, mountain bikes, and um, with a bit of kayaking and trail running. Wow, that's uh, that's really good. I think uh, I bet you're enjoying it there in Colorado with all those outdoor activities. Such an amazing landscape over there. So tell us a bit more, Tony. Over to you. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen and, and thank you, everyone. And you know what? I, I do wish I could be uh, in New Zealand. Um, obviously, if you do those particular sports like rock climbing and kayaking and anything in the mountains, New Zealand is absolutely stunning, uh, stunningly beautiful. I've spent a couple of trips there, and I'll be very, very happy to go back. So what I want to do is, over the next, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, introduce you to what we call Dark Tower. And I'll, and I'll give a bit of background, you know, adding on to what Joseph said. New Zealand is... I do... Um, Teach Ansible. I'm teaching it this week, and um, we're right up on the latest and greatest. In fact, I was in 2.9.12 today, so the very latest version of Ansible. So I teach it, and because I'm a team lead, I probably teach about once a month. Consultants, architects, and um, we do write production Ansible. In fact, we're going to talk about these machines there. This is actually a live, don't tell my boss. This is actually a live dark tower in action, and I don't know whether we'll see it this second, but it's actually running jobs right now. It's destroying stuff because the American day is over, and it looks like it's destroying a few systems or test systems. We're going to come back to that. Um, it's a very exciting time. Before we go in to talk about dark tower, it's a very exciting time, I think, in Ansible. We've seen some new features in the automation platform 1.1. Um, we've seen Ansible 2.9 and really protections are firming up. I think protections are going to be a very big feature going forward. For me on Tower, because I do a lot of my work around Towers, one of the things I'm curious about is how 3.7 will work in production. Uh, I installed a cluster today. In fact, all my students installed clusters. They spent the day building clusters and isolated nodes and everything worked well. but. Uh, 
we continue to see an evolution in both products. By the way, if any of you do use Tower, V7 removes RabbitMQ, which is actually quite a large component. So that's always something to, to check out, though it just seems to work. But what I want to do now is introduce our stateless dark towers and a project called Babylon. And um, I presented a version of this at Ansible Fest last year, and we've moved on since then. Uh, and this project is growing and growing for us. So what do we do? So my team teaches automation and does automation, but my organization, my boss, who you'll meet slightly later on, or you'll meet his picture, he run, he's director of engineering. We deploy stuff. We deploy hundreds and hundreds of servers. In fact, in a typical day, we deploy over a thousand instances to various clouds. We deploy them, we destroy, we idle them, we wake them up. In fact, if you looked at that screen and when we go back to it, you'll actually see systems being stopped, destroyed, created. So that's what we do. And this is actually some slightly old data. I'm not good at getting this type of data, so I couldn't uh, refresh it. But I think what you can see is our workload is climbing all the time. Red Hat is growing, and more and more teams within Red Hat are coming to us and say, can you deploy our stuff for us? So what do we deploy? We deploy things called configs. A config could be a full-blown OpenShift cluster. We go from nothing on Amazon or OpenStack or on Azure. We go from nothing. We build the base infrastructure, the network fabrics. We build the instances, and then we layer OpenStack on top of that. And not only that, we may then go and put workloads on it. So that's a, that's a relatively complex big job. We also um, deploy many applications. We have multi-tier applications, and we can actually deploy um, towers and tower clusters, and we can deploy satellites. Uh, we also deploy a lot of Ansible's workshops for them. So the, I don't work for the Ansible organization. Uh, we deploy a lot of their stuff. If you've ever done an Ansible workshop, it could well have been deployed by us. We're fairly cloud agnostic. But uh, what I will say is we're moving increasingly to OpenStack on IBM Bear Matthew clusters. So our ops team, same organization, um, my peers over there have built OpenStack clusters on IBM Bear Matthew. And we're pushing more and more work there because it is our low cost alternative. And we obviously have a lot of expertise in OpenStack. We deploy to AWS. It's big, it's the giant. Uh, it's very easy for us to consume. Azure, and we do a little bit of everything. And what we do is very dynamic. I might deploy something today on Red Hat 7.7, and my colleague Prakar, who's over in Sydney next to you, might decide that RHEL 8.2 is better. So when I wake up in the morning and deploy one, I'm on RHEL 8.2, and it's all done dynamically by injection of variables. How do we do it? So this is the old way. And I will be honest, this is the main production way. So Joseph or Michael or myself will go into a CloudForms application and we'll spin something up. In fact, maybe I have one. Do I have one handy? Um, we go into one of these and we say, hey, I would like this item. And we click and it goes to work. So I order one. I click on order and off it goes. And what happens is, oops, sorry. What happens is CloudForms calls a control node, a single control node sitting in Amazon right now. And it goes to work and it runs Ansible. So it's using Ansible Playbook. It's not using Ansible Runner. And it clones our big repo and it deploys to wherever we need it. Asia Pacific, Sydney, Tokyo, Frankfurt, and then other students and users and field are doing the same thing, deploying over and over again. So 
couple of problems or a few problems, single point of failure. If admin goes down, it would cause us an outage. We would recover, we'd flick the work over to it, stand by the development machine, but it's not really like an active passive standby. It's hard to scale. If we want admin to be faster or do more work, we would have to reinstall it on a bigger machine, not the end of the world. It's brittle. There's lots of touch points along the way which could break. And uh, there's a bit of bash in there. I'm not a big bash person. I'm very much of the Ansible way. Um, we have things like at jobs, which actually do the suspending and destroying, which is a bit primitive, but it actually works. We want to do an event like Ansible Fest or support it. We actually build a new control node for those frequently. So we do one offs, we do summit, we do a lot of IBM events for them and we build specialist infrastructure. And also, in this repo, Agnostic D, we'll come back to that, we have our code and our configurations and our variables, and they're welded together. They're in one place. So it's brittle there. Um, the, the whole infrastructure is code process is complex. And there's also lots of administrative bottlenecks, different people own things, and Getting things created in catalogs means I have to ask someone who has to ask someone. So it's not perfect. Nobody says, but not this Monday. Well, on Monday, for the first time for a lab, we've done a lot of events in Babylon and Dark Tower. But for the first time for some of our labs, it was actually for my course. They thought it'd break, so they would blame me anyway. Uh, we actually started running our labs on that. So very soon we'll be ramping up and we really will be regularly deploying one or 2,000 machines a day. At an event, we sometimes deploy 2,000 instances, but events are short-lived and they have a lot of eyeballs on them. I want to talk a little bit about Conway's Law. I don't know whether you've heard it. We came up with a solution to this problem and our solution might not be your solution. So I do want to acknowledge that there are certain challenges in doing what we're doing. But the nice, the good news is the towers are simple. We'll have a look at those and you're going to, you can take that work and use it yourself. The Babylon OpenShift component is somewhat more complex because as an engineering team, we have all of the Ansible advanced instructors and we have all of the OpenShift advanced instructors on call. We have full-blown, full-time OpenShift developers. We have Ansible developers. So for us, we have deep subject matter expertise, which maybe a lot of organizations don't happen to have, particularly on the OpenShift side. We have Red Hat certified architects, lots of them. Uh, Prakar, again, he's over in Sydney. He's a level seven. I think Natasha is a level seven. So we've got a very deep, um, depth of skills. Obviously, um, the technologies also effectively belong to Red Hat, so to speak, completely open source. So that is one thing. The R solution, which I'm going to show you, partly reflects our skills. The second thing is, you might be in a different world. You may have very long-lived infrastructure. You may be patching. You may be upgrading. Uh, you may be reverting. One of the things is if I want to upgrade a tower from 3.6 to 3.7, I don't upgrade it. I just deploy a brand new one and automatically fully configure it and throw away. So we practice very much immutable infrastructure and it might not map onto everything you do. But I do think there's a lot of value in the dark tower architecture in particular. So this is about a year ago in San Francisco. These guys on the right belong to Red Hat's Innovation Labs. They really understand Scrum. They kept us honest. We learned a lot about Scrum. This is Aston, and I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but that clock in the minute, if I try to bring up an issue about my dark tower, he will give me five minutes to talk about it, and then he'll shut me down. Petter, same team. There's my boss, Shah. It's his problem. This is his problem. He is responsible for those thousands of instances. We are based in France. 
he's uh, one of our operator uh, writers, and he's also the chief architect of Agnostic D, our deployer. This guy in the middle, Shah, the Shah, he wrote Agnostic D, and Guillaume's taken over. Jonathan, you're going to see again, he writes the OpenShift operators, and we're trying to build that and copy his expertise. And Noela keeps us all on track. Noela, um, she runs all these events. She's very technical, but she also project manages something like Summit, where there's so much going on, so many different environments, so much onboarding. So I'm actually surprised she's smiling. Um, so it's a great team. So just the key people for, again, we on this agnostic D, you're going to see that. He's kind of the architect. These are just the leads. There's many people involved. Jonathan is the OpenShift operator, then what's called Anarchy. We'll see what Anarchy is. I'm the lead on Tower, but to be honest, it's people like Prakar and Mattel and Jonathan have done a lot of work. And then Shah, he just enables us to do this. He used to live in Sydney. He's moved to America now. Uh, great team to work with. Uh, we had, we've had a lot of fun doing this. So what is it? Project Babylon. So Shah came up with the name. And no offence to New Zealand, he said you cannot use a Lord of the Rings name. He knew that because it was Tower, he asked me to name it. And he <laughs> knew and, and Tower was going to be the heart of it. And um, of course, we, that's how, why so many other people have seen New Zealand. I've obviously been there. But um, he said, you're not using a Lord of the na Rings name, so I'm going to call it Babylon after the Tower of Babylon. So what is Babylon? So this is our architecture. I decided to talk you through it. Remember, the first one of the problems I said was our code and our configuration are together. So we pulled them apart. We um, pulled them apart. And agnostic D became the code base, i.e., this is a thing that creates CloudFormation's templates and uh, sets up repos. All the Ansible lives in agnostic D. And agnostic V is variables. Variables upon variables upon variables. And they're very separated, so we can do dev, test, and production. So Guillaume's agnostic V, it's a lot of YAML. I mean, this is Guillaume. He lives in a world of YAML. To be honest, he doesn't, because what happens is um, he's created the architecture and an operator, and we modify the YAML. And it's a really nice architecture, because what happens as an organization, we set a bunch of files, deploy to US East 1. Uh, your standard machine is a T3 medium. And then inside this organization, oops, forgot I could click on that. We have a directory for my config, 3 tier app. And I have dev versions, test versions, and prod versions. So I go to common.yaml and say, give me T3 mediums. Give me this. Put it in US East 2. Um, create a user called this. You know, these are the repos I want. And then if uh, Prakar is working on a development version and he's pushing it forward, he puts overriding variables in dev. I'm working on prod. I put different variables in prod. And they automatically combine together in an order of precedence. And that is done by OpenShift. It's not done by Ansible. So this is a dictionary that it the, an operator, and I'll come to operators in a minute, creates. It takes all these files, and they could be very sparse, or they could be huge, a big open shift cluster. And it basically concatenates them together. So if we have um, Bastion system images, RHEL 7.7, RHEL 7.8, RHEL 7.9, and RHEL 8.2 in different places. The operators combine them in the right order, and the right precedence will win. So production would win over common. So what happens here? So we have the agnostic V repo, and the architecture is such, if you wanted to run on our stuff, you could have your own repo. We can deal with multiple repos. 
So you could put secrets in there. You could put configuration you didn't want to share with us. And we could have ours and our friends in other parts of Red Hat or IBM or Microsoft could have theirs. And every time there's a push to our agnostic theme repo, some get hard. They're all private, these ones. These ones are private. Everything else is open source. Um, an OpenShift operator sitting on an OpenShift 4 cluster is spinning, and it will pull it, and it will see the change. And it will recreate what that is. So that if we deploy a new tower cluster or three-tier app or whatever, it's right up to date with that change. And that is the role of the agnostic V operator. It kind of monitors those repos and makes sure that we get what we want. So what is an operator? Um, I'm guessing, I think everyone is familiar with Kubernetes to some degree and with OpenShift. But in my experience, most of us are not that experienced in operators. I once taught it. I taught it once in my life, never again. Um, I realized how much I didn't know. But an operator is really a custom controller. It's a pod and an OpenShift cluster and a Kubernetes cluster. And what it's really good at doing is managing state. Um, and that's what OpenShift is are fantastic for. And we can put in the operator all the logic around our application. They're written in Python. Um, Jonathan writes them. Guillaume writes them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other people who could write them. I would not like to write one. And we have three we care about. Agnostic V. And that is the one that um, combines our variables for us. Pull by. If I'm going to do a big event, and I need 50 Ansible, works 50 Ansible networking workshops, Poolboy will spin them up for me. But Poolboy will make a pool of 50. But it doesn't execute Ansible. It calls Anarchy. And Anarchy will manage those 50 systems. And Anarchy, and I'm very happy that I named Anarchy. So what happened was we came up with the name at Summit. The name became before the explanation for it. It was called Anarchy. And then I suddenly said, well, that obviously stands for Ansible Architecture in YAML. But it didn't come that way around. It was called Anarchy first. But anyway, that's our excuse. So what is it? what do we do with all this information? We go here. We pull this repo in, Agnostic D. This is very fresh, by the way. Uh, it's only a few hours old, 5,000 um, commits, 2,800 releases, hundreds of um, forks, lots of people using this. It's a really good piece of software. You can download it onto your laptop. Uh, by the way, in the training folder, we've got much better onboarding documentation than we had three months ago. Somebody in my team did a lot of that. Um, this is what deploys our stuff, completely open source. And what happens is, and when I spoke at Ansible Fest, you can probably see it says 32. I had 32 configs, or we had 32 configs in, uh, in it in uh, October last year. We're now up to 61. And one config might be used in many different scenarios, like the big open shift ones or the towers. We might use towers for teaching. And we might use the same towers for production. And we might use the same towers to build dark towers. We can build ourselves. Dark towers can build themselves. Um, we use massive amount of tags, by the way, lots and lots of tags. And those operators are passing tags. They're saying, I want you to deploy OpenShift 4.4 production version 1.8. And if it 1.8 breaks, we can revert to 1.7. It's a two-phase deployer. It is the infrastructure. In other words, go to your cloud, say, give me a network, give me a subnet, give me a router, give me 12 instances, give me security groups, NAT gateways. That's all infrastructure. Um, and we have cloud providers. You write a cloud provider for Google, we'll deploy all the stuff and the right to Google. That's all we need, a cloud provider. We write them. The second part is the software phase. This is. Um, Loading things like pulling in tower installers, 
pulling in Postgres installers or doing yum install Postgres, excuse me. Then in the software phase, this is where we'd be configuring it. So I don't know whether you use HANA or ServiceNow or um, MediaWiki, whatever, but this is where we would configure that. And then finally over here in the right in post software, tidy up, clean up, make sure, maybe send notifications out to various people. So uh, we can do full end-to-end -end deploys or we could stop at any phase here. So what happens? You click that button or Jenkins asks or GitLab asks what happens. Agnostic View already has made sure we know what an OpenShift 4419 cluster looks like. If we don't have one in pool by Anarchy asks Dark Tower to make it. It says, Dark Tower, make me this. And Dark Tower makes it. And that means all of our state is in OpenShift and none of our state is in Dark Tower. So we can throw our dark towers away every day, as long as they're quiet, and spin up new ones. And we'll see how we do that. Dark tower gets us instruction. I want an open shift cluster. I want this with this tag. And it dynamically creates the tower project. I assume everybody knows about a tower project. So, you know, tower project is typically a Git repo. It can be other things. So dark tower will actually make the project. And then it will create everything it needs, and then it will actually launch the job, and it will do that dynamically on the fly, and then it will deploy it. So, what does Dark Tower look like? Um, typical Dark Tower, three to five, um, three to five nodes, typically three at the moment. Remember, we can size within the node, or we can size uh, horizontally out of the nodes. I think you probably all know on number of nodes, you can just scale it out. Now, I was actually teaching isolated nodes today. I will say at the moment, we're not making use of isolated nodes. We proved it as a concept, but right now we're doing a lot of our testing in America, so we don't actually need them right now. But if we did, what would happen is, if you were spinning up from our catalogs, we would classify you as being in Asia Pacific, and we don't actually use Sydney very much. Prakar and Mitesh actually use it, but uh, we probably spin it up in Sydney or Singapore or Tokyo. So we would have an isolated node inside um, uh, Asia Pac, uh, one, Southeast One, etc., or our IBM clusters, our OpenStack clusters. We're running 3.6, we're very close to 3.7. 3.7 hasn't been out that long, and 3.6 has just worked. Uh, the actual clusters themselves are sitting on AWS. They can self-replicate. If I want to use a 3.7 dark tower cluster, I can ask my existing dark tower to build it for me. And we are going to build an infrastructure. When we do what you see there, it will be peered together. In other words, the three virtual private clouds will have visibility of each other. They won't be communicating over the internet. They'll be communicating um, over a virtual peer-to-peer -peer network, which Guion created the automation for. And here's one, they're dynamic. Let's go and have a look at one, actually. Here's one. Hopefully, I'm still logged in. Probably going to tell me I'm logged out. This is one right now. This is a real dark tower. It's actually a production dark tower. But interestingly enough, it's only been running for a couple of weeks. That's quite common because we throw them away. Whenever we want to try something new or we want to change part of the configuration of the base tower, we spin up a new one. Um, let's have a look at a job. So, uh, these are the empty config. Oh, these are one of mine. This is one of my students. One of my students has been running something called Ansible Multi-Tier today, and they're, they're all offline now. So uh, OpenShift 
probably that anarchy operator, eight hours after it started, it called Dark Tower and said, shut this machine down. Been up for eight hours, shut it down. And that's what it's doing. So it's actually suspending a bunch of nodes on Amazon. So how does it do all this, by the way? And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a dark tower. Oh, I'm in the wrong browser, sorry, excuse me. I've lost my crimson. Okay. So how does it do it? It has a single job. So when we bring, we have a single project and a single job. And the job is called the job runner. And the job runner self configures itself. I'm going to take you and have a look at the code. This is the job runner. Slightly different now. It is loaded with this job. It does a bunch of checks and then it creates a job manifest for anarchy and it creates an organization if it needs to. It creates a project. Notice it doesn't create an inventory. It creates a tower job template and then it launches that template. And that means I can use one dark tower to bring up an environment, I can destroy it, and I can ask another dark tower to just dis to destroy that environment. Because those stateful operators will pass the same set of variables and the new dark tower will be able to do the git clone operations, check them out to the correct tag inside the project and destroy it. And then it does some housekeeping and uh, lets us know what's going on. So it's a very powerful and very simple architecture. In fact, you can try it yourself. You can try this tiny piece of code. Here is Dark Tower. Um, I'll make sure Joseph and Michael actually share the URL with you. I can share it I, in the chat after. Hi Tony, before we go to the actual code, we just one we just have one question from our audience. How do we facilitate with the import and export of job templates between the tower instances in the Dark Tower? So, so uh, how do we do what between the dark tower? How how do we facilitate with import and export of job templates between the tower instances? Ah, it's a so it's a cluster. So, so um, a, a great question. Let's let's um, talk about that. In uh, so, you might not like the way we write um, our job templates. And we're about to switch to a collection to do this written by the community of practice. But, um, oh man, so Jonathan's been at it. Jonathan's really good. So basically what happens is, let's just say we have elastic load balancers. So Anarchy calls the elastic load balancer, called Tower, you know, Dark Tower, whatever. The elastic load balancer puts it onto any node, but because it's a tower cluster, it's propagated across the node. So what effectively happens is tower node number two or whatever writes it back into Postgres. And because this is a 3.6, everything is propagated uh, with a mixture of RabbitMQ and Celery uh, running the queues. But all three nodes instantly have access to the template because they see it in the shared Postgres instance. So we don't have to do anything. So you have a tower cluster and it's 10, 11 nodes. Almost instantaneously after you created it on the first node, it's propagated. Okay, does that help? So what actually is going to happen then is, if we go back to the job runner, we're going to make it here. We're going to make it there. And then we're going to launch it. And by the time we launch it, everyone has it. We don't even have a timeout in the 
It's just the way the cluster works. That is, by the way, one of the reasons why you can't really separate tower clusters themselves in their current architecture. They like to have very low latency connections. So just going back here. So it's completely dynamic. Nothing needs to be backed up. We do not, I totally honestly, we do not back up Postgres. We do not back up towers. I mean, if you backed up a tower, it's very easy. Set up minus B and away you go. It's very, very easy to back up a tower, but we don't back them up. And in fact, what we're doing right now is a new architect, well, a refinement of the architecture. In the old architecture, we spun up one dark tower cluster. In the new architecture, we spin up two, two clusters. And if one cluster dies, we flip over to the second cluster. And if it's a big event, the second cluster will be awake. If it's just day-to-day -day use and we could deal with a five-minute outage, uh, we would just suspend it. But can I say, in all the work that we have done, most of our excitement has been around those open shift operators. They are much more complex. Um, and the dark towers have consistently just worked. And in fact, let me see if I can get Brave up again. Um, I'll bring Brave up again. So here it is. Sorry. This is our dark tower cluster. So this one has, uh, in the last uh, 12 days, deployed, it's done about 6,600 jobs. And notice the pattern, job runner, job runner. Every second job is the job runner. And that means that somebody has asked it to create this thing. And the job runner has gone off and created the project. Isn't that surprising? Not very many projects and the templates. Lots of templates. 161 templates, 3,200. These are destroyers running, and that's not surprising. Um, late, um, oh, this is alphabetical, so that's why it's not surprising. <laughs> um, I want to call out something else which might surprise you, inventories. We only have one inventory. And if we go in here, we can show you something else which will surprise you even more. We don't have any hosts. And this is unusual. So I realized that if some of you were going to onboard this sort of, or you see value in this and you want to bring it into your organization, you might want to change it slightly. Because as a team, what I didn't mention was we do everything in memory. We do no dynamic inventories. We do no static inventories. We do everything. It's um, when you're doing cloud end-to-end -end deploys, there are huge speed performance gains from using in memory inventory. Uh, because if you do, if you're doing an end-to-end -end deploy, the inventory is always run at the beginning of the playbook. So you find out about 2,000 machines, but you don't care about them because the machines you care about, you haven't yet built. So then you go off and build them, and then you run your inventory again, maybe with Meta. And you spent, an, on AWS, you spent eight minutes generating inventories. We can in, do an in-memory inventory in seconds. And tomorrow morning, I'll be teaching people how to do in-memory inventories. If you've never used one, it's actually very, very easy. You think, wow, it's so easy. Why isn't it always like this? So these are, this is Dark Tower. Now I need, I just want to show you before we leave Dark Tower, this is a bar file to build a Dark Tower. So we wanted a Dark Tower to build a Dark Tower, agnostic V, would crunch variables which look like this. Okay, it would crunch, it crunch these together. 
and make um, the job runner and the necessary stuff to support it. There it is. There's the job runner. It actually makes three. It makes a, a dev test and production one. Uh, on a production server, we probably wouldn't have dev and test. So it's very, very simple for us. We do everything in Ansible, everything in YAML. Where's my Chrome gone? Chrome seems to want to keep on hiding itself. OK. And it's nice, because we don't have to worry about it. Disaster recovery becomes relatively easy for me. We've got a lot to do. But we're cut, so we've done some major events. So Red Hat Summit is our flagship event as a company. Just like Ansible Fest is the Ansible BU or Business Units flagship event, we ran um, Summit off the back of a Babylon Dark Tower combination. We've run a whole bunch of events. When Ansible Fest comes around, we will spin up a lot of their infrastructure on Dark Towers. So, what next? We're going to roll this out globally. So this week was actually a little bit of a landmark for us because we started using it for what we call labs to open tlc.com, not just events. We're going to enhance it so if you and I have 28 different configurations, we can do 28, if we want, different virtual environments on the fly. We already do uh, half a dozen different virtual environments, but we want to make it very dynamic. So in other words, if you put in your FAR files, a requirements.txt reference. We went to actually our dark towers will create the virtual environment uh, at runtime dynamically and then execute inside that. We don't use workflows. And there's a reason for that. Workflows are great. But the reason why we didn't move to workflows is we want our deployers to be able to run on standalone control nodes and in OpenShift pods. So a workflow has lots of fancy logic in it, which is coupling of uh, playbook runs together. But now that we see how well the dark towers actually run, we're going to start using workflows. We need to do more automated testing. Quite a few of us have a bit of a Jenkins background, but we're a bit, we're not Host to children for CICD with Jenkins. Yet. And we're going to look at running it on top of OpenShift. Um, we'll see. I, I like it on VMs. I kind of understand VMs. I'm old. You know, I like to think of it on servers. So please, please try it out. It might not map entirely to the way you deploy things, but I hope there's some logic in there which you can utilize and. Um, if you are a big, if you are in the cloud space in particular, it may actually be um, very, very appropriate. Feedback, you can feedback to Michael, to Dozer, you can feedback to me. If you need to um, find it, bit.ly Babylon dash dark tower dash. So we'll make sure you get the slides. And um, with that, with that, I'm going to thank you, take any questions. Uh, if you want to see demo, if you want to see a job running, uh, you want to look at a log file, uh, it depends what you want. I'm very happy to do to do that. No, that, that was really awesome, uh, Tony. And um, yep, maybe uh, yeah. yep. If you uh, do, you want to stop sharing your screen? I can stop sharing my screen. And That's awesome, get... Tony. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank thanks you. very much for that. That's really cool stuff happening in your space. And not only the Dark Tower itself is cool, but also the namings that you have, Anarchy, um, Dark Tower. Sadly, you, c you can't use uh, the New Zealand uh, names for it, but um, that's really good. And actually, some some people are interested. Do you have like um, Red Hat swags for Dark Tower and Anarchy? Because um, those are two good... Uh, I think names, people are, you know, collecting secrets and stuff, but um, yeah, ju that's just on the sideline. I reckon you have it. <laughs> so they all have logos. Jonathan's right. uh, partner, yep. she created stickers. 
Unfortunately, I don't have any to send to New Zealand. I apologize. Oh, it's too bad. No, but that's really awesome. And um, thank you for sharing the resources to us. If um, any one of you guys miss any of those uh, URLs or the uh, Git repos, Tony will be sharing the slides to us. And uh, feel yeah. free to uh, get in touch and make sure that um, you get a hand on some of these uh, cool uh, uh, Git repos out there. So. Yeah, just feel free to uh, message me on the Meetup site, and we'll be more than happy to send you a, a copy. And don't worry, the video upload will be um, um, happening soon, as soon as I will, we um, finish this Meetup. So, yep, everything will be there for you. I will say one thing. If I get yep. a pull request, if I get a mm -hmm. pull request on Dark Tower from anybody who's on this Meetup, I will get mm -hmm. you some stickers, okay? Wow. Um, there you go. You That's can, it. So it's got to be a real pull request. It yeah, can't yeah. <laughs> be just moving one piece of white space. You give me a pull yep. request, I merge it. I'll send you the stickers. Oh, that's definitely uh, cool stuff right there, Tony. Good challenge, great challenge for um, the Ansibles out here in New Zealand. So if you're up for it, make sure you get a pull request. And um, yep, just hit up Tony. You got his email. And uh, he'll be more than happy to send you uh, swags. Yeah. So he, um, is there any other point that you want to um, um, highlight and make, Tony? Um, Probably an en ending statement for everyone. I'm going to say one thing. When I joined Red Hat, I thought the real way we do Ansible is from the command line. And Tower is just a pretty face. Tower is fantastic. It gives you API endpoint, role-based access control. It gives you workflows. It gives you scalability. It gives you isolated nodes. It's a fantastic platform. So if any of you are there still executing Ansible Playbook on Cron or from the command line, really, seriously, take a look at Ansible Tower. It is a fantastic platform. It's very, very, very nice. And we found it to be extremely reliable, even under load. It copes very, very well. I couldn't agree more, Tony, so I second to that. And with that, we re uh, thank Tony, thanks Tony K for his time and um, that awesome presentation. Thank you, Tony. Hope to have you again sometime. And um, I reckon we, would, we will see you on some of the Red Hat trainings if we, uh, if we get them, right? Maybe on some of the virtual yes. Ansible advanced trainings. So, yeah, that would be great. Thank and you. Um, I think there are a few people who already are up for your challenge, so I think you need to wait for the pull requests coming in. So. Good stuff, guys. And make sure you register on Ansible Fest, OK? So see you again next uh, meetup. Uh, probably in September, we'll have another cool topic for you. And uh, make sure you keep in touch. Thanks, everyone, and have a good day. Cheers. Thanks, Tony. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.